Well, greetings out there in YouTube land and welcome to today's video, which promises to be a very special one if the amp that's in this box is the one that I think it is. Okay, so without further ado, let's open it up and see uh, what's been sent to us for repairs. I wanted to take a second to express my appreciation to the vast majority of people who have been shipping me amps that are way better packaged than they used to be. Okay, look at this nice heavy layer of foam. I've got my letter here, a box with tubes. This is first class. I bet you the chassis arrived in great shape and it's going to be a cinch to pack it up and send it back. So thank you so much for listening to my suggestion. Well, here it is, ladies and gentlemen, and it's even better than I expected. One of Fender's crowning glories, the 1966 Blackface Super Reverb. This one has the AB763 circuit. Uh, we're going to go into detail about how it is different from the AA 763. To be honest, I think this one is the better of the two. So we're just going to have ourselves a field day here uh, doing all the repairs that are necessary. We'll read the letter from the owner and see uh, the minimum uh, improvements that uh, he's requesting. And of course we're going to add on a whole bunch uh, as we see fit by testing the components. On an amp of this historical significance, I'm not just going to go through uh, with a claw hammer and just rip everything out. Okay, we're going to uh, try to use some common sense in the work that we do. Okay, so let's take a look at the letter. Um, let's see, pots are scratchy. Hasn't been played in ages. 1982. It's at 38 years ago. Um, needs a new power cord. Oh, let's see, it, uh, it said that the output was erratic. Might be, you know, just a dirty uh, tube socket or something like that. Okay, you know darn well though that the uh, filter caps are going to need some work. Okay, he's just sort of just saying do what it needs and uh, boy am I going to. So uh, let's uh, start off by taking a look here at the top. Then we'll do the uh, usual, we'll flip it over uh, and take a look at the circuit and also at the probably completely original uh, reverb tank that came with it. Here's all the tubes and tube shields. Okay, so this is going to be a really special video, I think. Before we start on the circuit, let's have a brief historical review of the Super Reverb Amp. It was introduced by Fender in 1964. There are two main forms of it. Uh, there is the AA763 circuit and the AB763. The differences are slight and we'll discuss them. Okay, at the same time, 1964, which was a red letter day, I think, for Fender, uh, they also released probably one of their all-time most popular amps, which was the Deluxe Reverb with a, uh, a, uh, a and AB763 circuit. Now, the circuits, just like the designations, are virtually identical. Okay, they both have GZ34 rectifiers, but the Deluxe Reverb has 6V6s, and the uh, Super Reverb has 6L6s. Okay, so this then is going to be, I guess you could say, a Deluxe Reverb on steroids. Okay, let's look at a few other differences between them. First off, the high voltage winding of the power transformer in the Super Reverb will have to be capable of putting out a much higher uh, plate voltage than the corresponding transformer in the Deluxe Reverb output. We're going to operate these 6L6s at uh, around 460 volts DC, whereas the 6V6s will be operated at 415 volts. Okay, that's one main difference. Secondly, uh, we know that uh, the Super Reverb is going to have the same uh, speaker complement as the basement amp, which is four 10-inch speakers, which is to me the best speaker complement 
that Fender ever came up with. No fun to lug around, but magnificent uh, to the ear. Okay, the uh, Deluxe Reverb is going to have a single 12-inch speaker. Now, you know darn well that the output transformer for the Deluxe Reverb is only going to be coping with, what, 25, uh, 27 output watts, whereas the uh, Super Reverb output transformer will be coping uh, probably with almost twice that much, say 40 to 50 watts of output, and the speaker impedance here is only going to be uh, two ohms. Okay, these are all going to be uh, in parallel and therefore uh, are going to, uh, they're eight ohm speakers, and four of those in parallel will give you just two ohms of net impedance. Whereas the 12 inch uh, single speaker for the Deluxe Reverb is uh, generally an eight ohm speaker. Naturally, the uh, voltage ratings on the filter caps and reservoir caps will all be much higher than for the Deluxe Reverb. But, from a designer standpoint, very little difference. Okay, so with that in mind, let's get started. Okay, we'll be looking at the actually lower side of the amp here at first. Then I'll put it in the uh, chassis stand that I have so that we can see the control panels front and back a little better. But uh, when you go down the line and double check and see that all transformers are original, um, you can see that a lot of heat has been produced by these uh, 6L6 output tubes and it's reflected in the darkening of the chassis surface. This is the driver uh, Actually, it amounts to an output transformer that drives the a reverb tank just like a regular output transformer will drive a speaker. We'll talk more about that later. But uh, I think as you can see, this thing is in wonderful shape. Uh, I bet it hasn't been cleaned since the day it was bought, which is fine with me. Okay, let's take a look in the doghouse, which has actually stuck to the capacitors inside. Remember they put that uh, kind of black piece of weather stripping on top here and it's sort of grown to the caps. Okay, so uh, let me sit down the camera for a second and remove the uh, doghouse cover. All right, the cover's off and lo and behold awaiting us inside the doghouse some metallic copper colored electrolytic capacitors very unusual. We're not used to seeing those. Generally what we see are the ones with the cardboard covers, but here's why we see them. These have a 500 volt working um, voltage uh, capacity and 550 volt surge resistance. Okay, these are not Mallory's. These are general electric alumolytic dry electrolytic capacitors. Very special. Okay, this is more like what I'm used to. These are going to be the two reservoir caps in series to achieve the like 700 volt surge resistance. Okay, so it's a shame, but I think we're probably going to have to replace these uh, just to make sure that the amp will operate um, properly and uh, for a long time. I flipped the chassis over and really had to extend my chassis holder out quite a ways because this is a wide chassis. Okay, I flipped over the chassis and we can take a look at the virtually flawless control panel. You know, if you saw this at the Guitar Center, you'd probably think it was a reissue. Look at that. Just beautiful. And for those of you wondering why it doesn't say Fender Electric Instrument Company, it's because remember that was in 1965 and that's when CBS took over and they changed the name to Fender Musical Instruments. So 65's will say Fender Electric Instrument, 66's say Fender Musical Instruments. Okay. Oh, and one other thing I get asked. That doesn't mean it was patented in 1955. Okay, that number refers to some index or something of patents that isn't the date. Okay? Absolutely gorgeous. Look at that. I just can't get over it. Let's turn it around now and take a look at the rear control. 
Let's see, the serial number is A1 and a total of five digits. The control panel itself is absolutely perfect. One kind of sad note, uh, tape was put on here to identify the tube uh, locations and this piece of tape overlapped and damaged the 200 watt sticker. I'm going to have to find some way to remove that from the tape and then glue it back. Okay, we, you have to be really careful with tape on these things. It can cause all kinds of trouble. Okay, now let's take a look at the circuit. Now we can take a look at the circuit, which is remarkably unmolested. You see those roasted screen resistors, which have to always be replaced. They're always overheated. And then you see the grid stoppers in there, the 1500 ohm grid stoppers. Those are present on the AB763 circuit, not on the AA. Okay, so that is one sort of confirmation of the, of the fact this is an AB763 circuit. And the addition of those is part of what makes the AB, I think, superior to the AA. Remarkably unmolested. Typical, the three double cathode bypass caps and one single Everything really looks to be in good original shape, even here in the bias uh, negative DC supply. This is a, a bias pot, not a balance pot. Okay, remember in our last video we had a balance pot on that basement. Okay, uh, we're going to be seeing this circuit here for a while while I'm working on it, so there's no need to just go overboard here, but I thought you'd get a kick out of seeing what one looked like probably back around 1966 or so when it was built. Okay, let's get started on our work. Uh, we're going to have to order some uh, capacitors and some other uh, components, but uh, let's go ahead and, and check it out and see what we need to, to order. A few things of interest here in the circuit. Here are those uh, three oscillation loop capacitors for the tremolo. There's that little cucaracha there, the, the little uh, opto-isolator or photoresistor unit for the tremolo. And something I noticed down here as a welder and fabricator, look at the corrosion around these solder joints that uh, where the uh, grounds are connected to the chassis. I have a feeling they used uh, like an acid flux or some sort of corrosive flux to make sure that the uh, solder stuck and over time it has corroded the metal. It's actually like rust. About the only rust on it. Really nice. Well in the midst of amplifier work, uh, look what was delivered by FedEx. Uh, let's open it up and see what's inside. Hopefully no anthrax spores from those uh, people who always give my videos thumbs down. Wow, looks like we got something here on top. Uncle Doug's catnip and Casey, Jack, and Ollie's catnip. This should be exciting. Well, it looks like the labels might have been mixed up because there's nothing I like better than some ocean fish flavor cat treats. I'm telling you, I know some kitties are going to really enjoy this and playing with their furry mice. Wonderful. Now let's see what came for your old uncle. Wow, it's rare that anybody ever sends, uh, sends me any gifts. It's always those spoiled cats. But look here, uh, what is it, 12 ounces of just black black rifle coffee and, oh Lord, homestyle pretzels. You know those are going to be good. Well, let's look a little further. There's more awaiting us here in the box. Well, how about that? A really nice, good-sized coffee mug to drink my Black Rifle Coffee Company coffee. Well, that's, those two go together well. Now, I can't wait to try this out. Okay, now this takes the cake. Two long-sleeve work shirts. Okay, and look at the embroidery. Uncle Doug's Hot Rod Garage. 
beautiful car. Then uh, three uh, t-shirts in uh, black, red, and navy blue. Wow, and in each case the flames are a contrasting color. So nice. Absolutely beautiful. Let's see, there's a, a short letter here that uh, tells who this came from. Uh, so let's take a look at it. As we survey this incredible assortment of nice gifts, we find this letter, and it turns out it's from a good friend and viewer, Randy Forrest, a fellow Texan, and um, he says it's a small thank you for all you've done and continue to do. Wow, I'm humbled. Okay. The embroidery machine operator with the patience of a saint. Uh, and he singles her out as the only person who should receive credit, but I think I do give her credit because she does absolutely beautiful work. But also I think Randy, who made all this happen, deserves uh, the primary accolades. And I just want to thank you uh, for myself and for the kitties for your uh, great generosity and thoughtfulness and I assure you that uh, I'll be thinking about you on every one of these pretzels that I eat and every cup of coffee I drink. Thanks so much Randy. thought you might find this interesting. The owner of the amp sent me a picture of the tube chart from the cabinet and you see at the bottom right it says PD which would be April of 66 and you see that it does confirm that it is an AB763, not that you can always trust these tube charts. Okay, so there it is. Okay, it was a whole lot harder than I expected, but I was able, using different chemicals and heat, to get that little triangle of foil off of that really sticky tape, and then glue it back in place here. Okay, I know I'm probably nuts to fret over stuff like this, but I just think that looks a whole lot better than uh, having a big chunk missing. Okay, hope you like it. Well, my massive shipment of uh, new electrolytics arrived from uh, Antique Electronics Supply, so it's time to recap the mighty Super Reverb. Okay, so let's start off by removing the positive ends of all of the uh, big filter caps. Now recall that since these are in series, this will be the positive end of this one, and that's the positive end of the left-hand one. Well, the old caps are out, and the new caps are in. I went with uh, 22 microfarad at 500 volts for the three uh, electrolytics here and uh, 80 microfarads at 450 volts in series which uh, as you know uh, will provide a net uh, of 40 microfarads at 900 volts for the reservoir capacitance. So, uh, oh, also I uh, use metal oxide resistors to replace the 4.7K and 1K resistors here in the power supply. So uh, it's now finished and it's time to move on to our next challenge. Well, I reinstalled the doghouse lid. Everything looks uh, ship shape here on top. Let's flip this jewel over, put it up in the uh, chassis stand, and start working on the circuit. Okay, now we got it belly up. Uh, we see there's two, four, six, seven uh, cathode bypass caps that need to be replaced. Once these big fat cathode bypass caps are removed, you can see the cathode bias resistors and uh, always test them. And in this case, uh, they're supposed to be 1.5K, left one's 1.8, right one's 2.2. So I'm going to replace both of them. The two out of spec 1500 ohm cathode uh, bias resistors have been replaced with ultra precise uh, metal oxide resistors that are both exactly 1.5K. Then the two 25 a microfarad at 50 volt bypass caps are installed over the bias resistors. This procedure will now be repeated for each of the remaining 
bypass caps. And there you have it. All seven of the cathode uh, bypass capacitors have been replaced and several of the bias resistors. Now it's time to install the three-wire power cord. Uh, step one, of course, will be removing the old fossilized two-wire cord that the amp came with. Here's a little tip for those of you who aren't aware of it. You can order uh, bulk shipments of these complete power cords with both male and female receptacles attached. Uh, then all you do is just amputate the female receptacle, which sounds like some really outrageous medical procedure, and turn this, the remaining cord with the male plug, into your pigtail. Or you can order pigtails already made up for about five times as much. Okay, the decision is up to you. All it takes is a little snip here, and you've saved uh, four or five dollars. All you have to do is cut off the female receptacle, circumcise what's left, and then remove the insulation from the tips, and you have a wonderful new three-wire power cord for your uh, Super Reverb amp. The primary AC wiring is completed. The black hot wire here comes over to the gold receptacle on the AC outlet. Comes via the blue wire over here to one side of the on-off toggle switch. Out the other side of the toggle switch to the rear of the fuse holder. Then from the uh, proximal uh, pin on the fuse holder it will come over here to the one of the primary wires for the uh, power transformer. The white wire connects to the silver receptacle pin and directly to the other primary wire for a power transformer. The original ground switch now is completely separated from the circuit as it needs to be and I'm going to use it to make a switchable NFB loop later. And of course the so-called death capacitor that was right here underneath the ground switch and connected to uh, one of the lugs has been removed completely. Also, since I didn't have a good place to bolt down the uh, negative ground wire from the three-wire power cord, I just soldered it right to the chassis. Okay, when you do this, be sure that it's not a cold solder joint, that it's good and solid, and in this case it is. Now let's replace that 50 microfarad at 50 volt negative DC bias supply uh, filter cap check the diode, test it, and also test that resistor to make sure that they're both in good operating condition. And if you're wondering how to test diodes, put the positive or red probe on the striped end of the diode, the black negative lead to the unstriped end of the diode, uh, adjust your fabulous MassTech uh, digital multimeter to diode test, and read and you'll see in that configuration with the red uh, lead going to the stripe you'll get zero uh, conductance okay there is absolute total resistance now you reverse the leads so that the black negative lead is on the striped end and vice versa and you'll get a reading of around uh, 0 0.48, 0 0.49 uh, volts Okay, so it shows it conducts in one direction and not in the other, which is just what diodes are supposed to do. Now it's time to replace those uh, roasted uh, screen resistors and then the grid uh, stopper resistors down underneath. This is a good example of what heat does to carbon comp resistors. Uh, remember this one's supposed to be 470 ohms. Look at it. 653. That's what close to 50 percent over. Um, they don't hold up to heat very well. Remember these are the screen resistors so you have to replace them. I'm using uh, metal film and metal oxide resistors here because they resist heat and uh, they tend to retain their value a lot better than carbon comps. This is the second of the two screen resistors and you can see uh, it's not a fluke. Both of these things uh, have gone way, way over spec. Okay, all the chassis work here has been done. The negative DC bias supply, the two output tube sockets, the primary wiring, um, the three-wire power cord, 
and of course the cathode uh, bypass uh, capacitors and resistors. Now we won't, we won't know if anything else here is malfunctioning uh, like the little tremolo bug here or whatever uh, until after we tested the amp. But now with these new components I feel reasonably confident that we'll cause no harm by trying it out. Okay so I think it's time to flip it over uh, put in some tubes and see what happens. Well I carefully unwrapped all of the individually wrapped and labeled tubes and inserted them in their proper respective uh, tube sockets. I was absolutely floored by the uh, brands that I saw here. We've got uh, Kenrad, Mullard, Amperex, Black Plate RCA uh, 606GCs, Mullard uh, GZ34, absolutely astounding. But bear in mind that this amp has been in storage for, what, around 50 years? And 50 years ago, these were the tubes that you could buy, uh, probably for a dollar or dollar fifty a piece. So this is like a time capsule back into an earlier period where really high quality tubes are readily available at a fair price. Uh, a period of time we can only long for nowadays. Here we go with our first test. Uh, the chassis is in the stand. All tubes are in place. The Eurotube uh, bias uh, monitors are plugged in in series under the 606G. I have the, uh, all the tone controls at a setting of 5, which is neutral, volumes off, bright switches off, and we're injecting a 500 cycle per second tone into the normal channel. For the viewer that complained about having to listen to test tones, uh, I apologize, but you're just going to have to uh, fast forward a little because uh, there will be test tones in the next uh, minute or two. And I have two 8 ohm speakers connected for a net impedance of 4 ohms, bearing in mind that this output transformer is accustomed to 4 8 ohm speakers for a net impedance of only 2 ohms. So we will keep the volume down a bit uh, while we're testing, but we should have no problem. Let me switch it off of standby and let's crank up our volume here just a bit. We hear the tone clearly. We see that the tubes are in the same ballpark but are not real well matched. Also, um, looks like I've got plenty of uh, volume. Let's turn this down and plug into the vibrato channel. Okay, here we go. Same, you see the little tremolo opto isolator is flashing. So at least we know that works. Let's uh, test our intensity and speed of our tremolo. Wow. Well, that's one thing we won't have to fix. The one thing, it might be a little fast, so we'll slow it down. Good, strong intensity. Now, last but not least, let's turn up the reverb and see if it works. I'm going to bounce the tank. Oh, yeah. Sounds like prom night at the Bondage and Discipline Center. Okay, so it looks like uh, this is an up and running amp with some not so well matched output tubes. Uh, let's think about that for a few seconds and figure out an approach. Let's look at the schematic to see if there's some external source that might be causing the output tube imbalance. Okay, here comes our bias voltage up here and what if um, on these 220K resistors what if one of them had drifted way up, like 500K, so that the bias voltage was different on the two grids? Let's measure the resistance of those two and uh, see if they check out. Well, there's the right-hand one, and here's the left-hand. I don't see a world of difference between them. Not enough to explain the uh, imbalance. 
Okay, so we'll have to look elsewhere. One other possibility might be the 1500 ohm grid stoppers, uh, but those are brand new resistors uh, and I tested them before I installed them and they're perfect. So uh, what it is, it's an internal uh, problem with one of the tubes. It just can't flow as much current as the other. I'm double checking the disparity between the two tubes and uh, we can see this one is probably running around 12.6 watts of plate dissipation and this one is a shade over 14. Okay, so there definitely is a difference between them. Remember though in the previous video when the difference caused a hum in the speaker and in this case there's absolutely no hum whatsoever so I'm tending to think that this may be an acceptable disparity. Remember that our adjusting pot right here is for overall bias, not for balance in this particular circuit. Okay, so uh, my vote is that we're going to leave these tubes as is and uh, see how they sound and go from there. I will add uh, that the school of thought about perfectly balancing output tubes has changed a little bit here lately uh, and a lot of people tend to think that a slight uh, mismatch actually generates a more complex tone with more uh, even numbered harmonics and I tend to agree with that uh, mainly because some of the best sounding amps I've ever heard in my life had imbalanced output tubes also, some that sounded wonderful had perfectly balanced tubes. So, I honestly don't think it's as big a deal as we've been led to believe. And we're going to find out with this particular amp, it looks like. So, while we have the chassis belly up, let's go ahead and convert that pesky old ground switch into a switchable NFB loop. And we see that the NFB loop begins here at the external speaker contact continues on through an 820 ohm resistor and then comes down uh, here where it feeds into the grid and cathode of the long tail pair phase inverter. Okay, so let's uh, locate it in the circuit and here we see the NFB wire comes around here and disappears in the little um, gopher hole right there and pops up right there connected to the 820 ohm resistor. So what we'll do then is disconnect this wire right here from the um, external speaker jack and make it run through our uh, ground switch before it can make contact with the output jack. I disconnected the NFB loop wire from the external speaker jack added a little extension of matching wire so that it could reach over here to this side of the uh, ground switch then we'll run a wire from this end here over to that original contact on the external speaker jack here's the wire that went to the external speaker jack goes through the switch and here is the similar type of wire up here that connects back to where that first wire originally connected. Now the NFB is switchable. Time out uh, for a little uh, safety pointer. No visual pun intended. Before you start working on any amplifier circuit you should make yourself a capacitor discharging tool. Uh, I made this one from a plastic handled Phillips screwdriver. I ground the tip to a sharp point and then you add a 10 watt 100 ohm resistor with one of its leads to the metal shaft of the screwdriver and the other to a wire that you clip onto the chassis. Oh, and you also have to wrap everything with black tape so that you don't inadvertently touch any metal. Then uh, after you've turned off the amplifier you go in and touch all the places where the B plus is present. If you have electrolytic capacitors uh, in the circuit evident, uh, you know, present, you can go in and simply touch each of the positive leads of those electrolytics. Okay, it's essential that you do this because even after you've turned off the amp, the capacitors will hold a charge so that if you touched 
uh, a B-plus spot and the chassis of the amp, you could receive just a horrendous shock, okay, and we don't want that. So uh, make this tool and use it uh, every time uh, you work on an amp. Now it's time for our final uh, modification to the circuit. We're going to slow down the tremolo and hopefully you remember from previous videos we do that by increasing the value of one of the 0.01 microfarad oscillation loop capacitors. Here you see I have a 0.01 microfarad cap connected to two jumpers and those jumpers are putting it in parallel with one of the 0.01 microfarad caps in the loop. I'm going to put the camera on the tripod now and we'll try it with and without that supplemental 0.01 microfarad cap. Okay, the tremolo is at its lowest speed of 1 and intensity of 9. Now listen to the speed drop when I connect this supplemental uh, capacitor. probably about half speed. I think that's slow enough. Let's go ahead and hardwire in this cap and test it again. You all know what a tremolo hound your old uncle is and I can't resist. Let's go ahead and add another 0.01 microfarad cap in parallel to the second of the existing 0.01s. Okay, so we'll be doubling up both of the 0.01s, not just one of them. Let's see what it sounds like with and without. Okay, here we go. That's with one parallel 0.01. I like it. Let's go ahead and uh, jump her both then. Okay, let's hardwire the second one in. Okay, two supplementary capacitors. Are you ready? Oh, that's about as slimy and belly crawling as a tremolo can get. Let's run the speed up. Even at high speed, you can still differentiate between the peaks. Before, it was almost like no tremolo when you turn it up to 10. Oh yeah. Okay. I think we're done. I don't know about you, but I think I'm going to go take a bath after listening to that. And uh, flip this jewel over, and we're going to get Ollie and Jack to uh, sober up from their catnip binge and strum us some tunes. Well, we're out in the workshop getting all geared up for the audio demonstration on the mighty Super Reverb and we unpacked our brand new Frameworks microphone stand uh, sent from Sweetwater and uh, it was bought for us by a very generous viewer uh, since this was drop shipped to us, I don't have the return address. So whoever uh, the generous viewer was, please identify yourself in the comments section so that we can thank you profusely for this really nice and really useful gift. Well, the Super Reverb is ready to go. I have two 8 ohm uh, shop speakers connected uh, for a net impedance of 4 ohms, and we know that 2 ohms is really what this output transformer uh, was designed for. So we're a little high on the impedance, but I really think we'll get by. Um, I will show you the settings that I uh, will be using on the audio demo uh, volume treble and bass. This will be on all of the um, tunes played on the normal channel. On the vibrato channel it will be the same. About we'll go 5 and 5 on the treble middle and the bass cranked up just a little. Uh, this will be the reverb setting that you hear on reverb tunes and this will be the standard tremolo settings. 
on one tune that I will designate I will be switching the negative feedback loop on and off I'm going to leave it up to you to tell when that happens I think it's so obvious it will jump right out at you it's kind of fun just listening and I honestly think you're going to be able to spot the exact times that I flipped the switch I'll be honest with you uh, we got so carried away enjoying the fantastic tone and effects that this uh, amp is capable of that I didn't keep really good track of uh, the different settings and what was used on different tunes so you're just gonna have to use your ear okay and honestly I think it's gonna be real obvious when there's tremolo or when there's reverb or when there isn't okay so let's get started uh, we've got our new mic stand set up here with our Shure M57 uh, focused on the uh, new Jensen 12-inch uh, ceramic speaker in the Ampro cabinet. So without further ado, uh, let's get Jack and Ollie tuned up and let's play some tunes. Oh, and one last thing. Instead of just sitting here for 10 minutes looking at the amp and speaker while the audio demo is in the background, I'm going to go outside and get some uh, really nice, pretty restful images for you to look at while you're listening to Ollie and Jack's latest hits. Okay, let's try that, see what you think.
I guess that's about it for this video featuring the magnificent 1966 Blackface Fender Super Reverb Amp. I have to say I don't think I've ever enjoyed an audio demonstration any more than this one. Uh, in fact, like I said, we got carried away and didn't even pay attention to the settings or anything else. It was just the great sound of this amplifier taking us back to the good old days back in the 60s. I want to be sure to thank my Patreon patrons and PayPal contributors for keeping us on the air one more month advertising free. 
If you'd like to join them, uh, please see the links in the video description that will enable you to do I also wanted to uh, thank the generous viewer for sending us this fabulous Frameworks microphone stand. And of course, a major hats off to Randy Forrest for that fantastic box of, of pretzels, cat treats, and those beautiful embroidered t-shirts. As you know, uh, our second hobby here has been fixing up old hot rods, uh, trucks, cars, and the like. And I've been adding a bunch of videos as second features onto the amp videos. Well, a bunch of viewers said, why not start a second channel dedicated to hot rods and uh, car modification and the like. So we've done it. Using the logo that Randy designed for us and prepared on uh, that group of t-shirts that you saw earlier, uh, we have started a second channel and it is, as you might imagine, named Uncle Doug's Hot Rod Garage. Uh, we'd appreciate it if you go over and take a look. I probably have, uh, say, 12 videos posted there now for you. And uh, a lot of them are ones that long-term viewers will recognize as the second features and all from some of the AMP videos. However, I've also included a bunch of un uh, previously posted material. Uh, so there's new stuff and old. Uh, but I guarantee in the future we'll be posting a bunch of brand new videos just for you all. So please do a quick search. Uh, I'll put a link in the video description and check out our new channel. Uh, we're just getting started. I think at the moment I have about 80 subscribers and um, it's kind of an odd feeling to start from scratch again on a new channel, but I know with you all's help and support this one will be just as successful as our amplifier channel. I've always said we have the best viewers on all of YouTube and uh, this is just something that uh, Ollie and Jack and Casey and I have tried to whip together to just sort of give you all even more to look at in your spare time. More excuse to drink beer, uh, more excuse to aggravate your wife, okay, and as if we needed more excuse. So check it out when you have a chance please subscribe and thanks so much for watching and for all your great support over the years and hopefully in the future